everyone. Thanks for coming out on such a cold, snowy night, rainy night. Um, we're going to do things a little differently. We're not going to have a moderator for this panel. It's going to be a very informal uh, discussion. And I hope you guys will share questions and we'll have time for Q&A at the end of it. But we're just going to go right down the line, first introducing ourselves and saying a little bit about who we are. And then each panelist up here is going to ask a question and we'll all answer them and we'll go back and do it again if we reach the end of the line and still have time. I'm Margot Sagel and I'm the owner of Wachung Booksellers, a, a general bookstore in Montclair, New Jersey, uh, which I've had for 20 years. Um, I'm Emma Brockway. I'm a publicity coordinator at Scholastic and I've been there since I graduated Barnard in 2010. I'm Jenny Milchman, and I graduated Barnard in 1992, and it was about eight years after that that I started trying to get published, and my first novel just came out last week. <laughs> I'm Liat Siegel. Um, I self-published my novel, uh, The Gods She Chose, um, about a year ago now, and um, graduated from Barnard not long before that. So. <laughs> I'm Anna Stein. I'm a literary agent, um, and I graduated from Barnard in 97. And I just want to say a big thank you to Faith Rusk for putting this all together in this wonderful room. And thank you, Faith. Making a warm night on a cold night. OK. OK, so I have the first question, and it's basically the title of this talk is The More Things Change. And I just want to know what uh, everyone thinks about uh, whether publishing has changed in the last few years. Did I start and Emma, with all your experience. Yeah. <laughs> two and a half years that I've been publishing. Um, I guess like I can compare what I thought publishing was when I was a senior at Barnard to now what I see being in the industry. Um, so I thought it was kind of this like impenetrable fortress that I'd never be able to be a part of. Um, and I thought that it was like, you know, very old school publishing and it was very kind of difficult and there wasn't camaraderie and it had this like very antiquated notion of what publishing was. And then I worked at Scholastic and I realized happily that I was mistaken. Um, and I see publishing as an extremely collaborative process. Um, and, you know, every department works with every other department and the authors are like such a huge part of everything we do. Um, so I would say that my initial thought of publishing not being collaborative um, and um, kind of seeing it as static was incorrect um, because I see it as quite interactive um, and evolving even in the past two and a half years. Um, as I mentioned, I started trying to get published back in 1998 and I sent all my query letters by snail mail um, because I was silly and green, I actually sent them by FedEx because I thought if you made it important, you might get an answer faster. Um, the publishing people know it doesn't work that way. It's changed an immense amount. You know, I was on submission. I was working with agents. I wrote eight different novels over a period of 11 years, and I worked with three different fantastic agents. Um, and we had 15 editors want to make offers on one book or another and never, you know, the, the editor when it is from a publishing house, the editor has to get the rest of the house on board. Um, and so there has to be a real consensus behind a book and that was the point at which I was stuck. And during those 11 years, the whole publishing world changed out from under me so that by the end, far from snail mailing my queries, people were saying, why don't you just self-publish it? You know, that has become a viable, even a better route in some ways. And really the whole industry, I would say, changed out from under me um, during the time that I started trying to now. Yeah, I would say similar to um, what Jenny just said. Um, obviously, I don't have the many years of experience, um, but from what I thought about publishing, I thought that um, it would just be impossible to publish without um, a connection in um, beforehand. So, uh, but now it really, I think with the rise of Kind of self-publishing in ebooks. Um, there's there are viable options um, for self-publishing, and um, I think you know it it just does reflect a, a lot more of a dynamic industry um, because you're able to 
choose from more options. I mean, obviously, traditional publishing is still a great choice, um, but where there wasn't really another good alternative, now I think um, more alternatives do exist. Uh, I would say um, that the, the three big changes, I, I guess I've worked in publishing for about 10 years now, and the three big changes that I've seen, um, believe it or not, are email, uh, electronic devices for reading, uh, for reading books, and Amazon. Email because now we hardly ever get query letters by mail anymore. I mean, a few years ago, I, and when I say a few years ago, I mean literally a few years ago, we didn't even, we wouldn't accept electronic uh, query letters. I would delete them when I got them because I thought that's really rude. You should just send, <laughs> send them. Like, and now, um, now I, you know, if we, if we get an envelope in the mail, we think, what is this? <laughs> Why are they saying it this way? So that's the, that's the first one that I would say is just sort of um, the way we do business now. It used to be when you signed up a client, you would have to, Part of their contract um, would say that they would have to reimburse you for the cost of printing and the cost of you know mailing things out. It doesn't exist anymore. We don't print anything. I mean, we print some things out, but we don't really print much, and we certainly don't send much. Um, every time we submit a novel, it's electronically. Every time we ask for a novel, um, it, it's generally electronically. So. Um, so that's, that's completely radicalized the business. The second thing, uh, uh, electronic devices, um, it means that books are read differently. You know, if, if, um, if a book landed on your desk and it was, you know, the manuscript was this tall, you know, you would look at it a little differently. Now, when, it, when you receive it, you don't really know how many pages it is. You're just, you're just reading. And, I find it a less pleasurable experience, but you know it's it's um, it's just complete. I think it's changed our attention spans. Um, it's it's changed in, some, in ways that I don't even know yet. And the third, Amazon. Um, well, Amazon has affected the industry in so many ways that I, I don't you know I don't want to go on and on about it. But effectively, um, we've lost probably fifty percent, no, maybe seventy five percent of bookstores. Um, in the country since Amazon started, and so the actual the book business is on its way out. Um, Amazon, as we were talking about earlier, Amazon's business is really um, things, not books. So it's so they have driven the industry in the direction of getting everything digital, everything on Kindle, so that you'll buy a Kindle. Um, and the the business of selling physical books, it's something that. Um, that's it's sort of an, an annoying, annoying extra that they have to give you, um, and and slowly they're they're going to phase it out, um, and then their their publishing wing, they're they're clearly um, already in the business of publishing books, and um, and if you if you sort of look at all of the the the, the steps leading up to where we are now, it's clear that they're very happy for publishers to cease to exist. Um, and I, I'm not, uh, you know, maybe agents one day. So this is completely radicalized, the, the way we do business, the way we read, and, um, and our ability to make money, basically. Yeah. And I'm glad to have the bookseller's perspective. Yeah, my person. I can speak about publishing from the bookseller's perspective. Uh, when uh, I bought a neighborhood bookstore what year was that? 96. So that was uh, when bookstores were struggling against superstores, the, the big evil. Then, and we survived that. Then uh, Amazon hadn't even started. Or if it did, I, I think it was so obscure. Like we didn't even, it wasn't even on our radar. Uh, then Amazon came with their onslaught and we survived that. We survived the crash of 08. We survived, uh, and we're actually surviving ebooks. Uh, we um, came from a com uh, come from a fairly wealthy community of commuters. They were early adopters to e-readers. I thought this is the January three or four years ago, January March. Our sales plummeted so dramatically. I thought, wow, I I just never thought we would end like this this dramatically. I, I thought it would peter out, but started coming back. Every year, January to March, we see a little drop, and we don't anymore, because now we're getting people coming back. People are tired of not finishing their books, of not enjoying them as much, 
Uh, there's, it's, it's a choice to read on an e-reader, um, and people, some people prefer it for traveling, and some people prefer to have a real book for traveling. It, it's become, it's come down to a personal choice, but um, there's still less of a, there, are, there are less um, outlets for the publishers. Uh, Barnes and Noble is now going to close 200 stores. I'm thinking, great, there'll be more, you know, independents opening up. Well, there won't. Uh, and the publishers are just seeing it as a like scary point. Where do we go? Um, but we can address, you know, uh, what do you call it? Self-publishing, which I think is a fabulous outlet, but it also is um, an unvetted uh, industry. And anybody, you just how do you distinguish a very carefully wrought manuscript from just some rants that someone put together? I can't. As a as a bookseller, I don't know how the consumer does it. You, you know, it's it's every, it, it's too much wild wild west. Every man for himself. Some people know how to market their books. Some people don't. I don't know where that's going, but yeah, publishing is upside down. And uh, but somehow it still survives. Apparently, uh, publishing has been complaining about being on the brink of disaster for the last 40 years, so. But now we really are. Well, <laughs> in one, yeah, one way, I mean, yeah, Amazon is the biggest threat because they're, they love self-publishing. Huh? You just send them their manuscript, they print it out, it's, <laughs> they don't care. It's, you know, they got their money, they don't care. Whereas uh, publishers, at least from days of yore, they wanted to make authors. They wanted to make books. They wanted to make sure that it got out there and somebody loved it and appreciated it and it went somewhere. So, yeah. It's my rant. <laughs> so I think that actually segues nicely into the next question, um, which is, was there a mark change X number of years ago or has the industry always been evolving and in a state of flux? And it sounds like you think yeah. it's always been evolving. I mean, talking to people who, who are have been in the business longer than me. They just keep telling me it's been a state of flux forever. Um, and that there are, um, you know, there will always be adjustments. I, I thought the most ironic thing was when um, Barnes & Noble closed down here at Lincoln Center and NPR, I mean, had a dirge. Everybody was crying that Barnes & Noble was closed. But I'm sitting there, doesn't anybody remember the Upper West Side had an independent bookstore like every other block? and Barnes & Noble came in and wiped that all out, so, you know. People are saying, <laughs> save our local bookstore. Yeah. About that Barnes & Noble. Yeah, closing. exactly. I thought, wow. <laughs> so. You want to take it up? Um, I actually don't know if I can really answer this question, <laughs> um, so I'm going to pass it along. I mean, I have a lot of things to say. First, I want to say that I'm a huge devotee of bookstores. Um, if you want to come up to me afterwards, you can learn about the holiday I started that supports bookstores. Last year, as I heard it, there were more independent bookstores opening for the first time mm -hmm. in, in recent. So to my mind, I'm going to get to this, but I mean, to my mind, there's a convergence right now of cultural trends. There's locavorism and there's, you know, a, a realization that if we walk down in my town, you know, Main Street, but here call it Broadway, and we just have Rite Aid and the other chains, we've really lost something. And so was there a market change X number of years ago? I mean, I would go back, I guess, to what Anna said about email. I mean, that certainly made a huge, huge change. Um, and you could almost think, well, the writing's on the walls. We prefer to read. It's easier. We don't have to print out manuscripts and all that. But I do think that people are speaking. And there seems to be a really deep love for the medium that is a book. You know, that that particular hardware or software or whatever it is just works in, in a way that, you know, there's a reason it's been around since, since before the printing press. Um, and I do think that things, you know, just from my perspective, which goes back about 15 years now, there was always a state of flux. I mean, you know, each agent I signed with would say, it's harder than ever to sell a book. And it reminded me of when I was in college. Everybody said, this is the hardest year ever to get into college. And I just heard somebody who graduated in like 1963 say, that was a particularly hard year to get into college. <laughs> so. um, to me, it seems like um, maybe even before the whole technological age um, kind of 
came into being, there was some fluctuation. But I think that now with all the new technologies, um, you know, each one introduces a new market change in publishing. And um, I think the ebook on one hand, and um, I mean Amazon itself, as people have been saying, um, self-publishing through Amazon, self-publishing through other um, through other medium, you know, companies. Um, they've both made huge impacts on the industry um, for good and bad and uh, you know there there are more um, ways of reading there are more ways of publishing um, so I think you know it's definitely changing specifically with regard to all of the technological changes we see no. To to, uh, to go back to you know those those three big changes, um, the thing that I you know I was just I was, it's absolutely true that that, that Barnes and Nobles was the the enemy you know, and uh, mm -hmm. you know so obviously this is you know this is I guess eight ten years ago not long ago at all and nobody remembers that we are mourning right. Barnes and Nobles now. It was a little, then, I think it was twenty <laughs> twenty years ago. Sorry. I think I feel like it's a twenty year cycle. Yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then but then we all mourned. When people started talking about electronic books, everyone said, no, that's never going to happen. I mean, people love books too much. It's never going to happen. But l literally 50% of our sales are electronic now. So it's not, only, it's not only that, you know, that they've changed things. They've saved us. I mean, you know, it's hard to tell whether they've, they've killed bookstores um, and, you know, and that's the end of it. But they've killed bookstores and also saved us from going out of business because half of our sales are electronic. To make things more concrete, let me, let me give you some numbers. It used to be if you were going to publish a book, um, you know, you would want, let's see, you know, if a book was really going to perform well, 50,000 copies, you know, that, that's like, that was a good number. Now, 10,000 copies. Like, that's, that, that's like, that's a really good sell through. And that, of course, means that the advances that publishers are paying for books are much lower because you know they they literally can't sell enough books to to keep paying big advances. So everything has altered. You know the the way the way we even you know even the way we design jackets now for for books. A jacket that looks really good on a physical book might not look that good, you know, as a small icon on the screen. So. You know, there are those subtle changes that we're not even thinking, you know, a lot of people don't even think about. Um, uh, you know, I could go on and on, but, but uh, I mean, the, the industry, of course, has always been in flux, and, and, we, um, and, and we always do think this is the worst, but, you know, there, those are some, you know, some, some concretes to, uh, uh, to give an example of where we are now. Oh, my turn. I feel like, just to build on what you said, though, I feel like one question that the jury's still out on is whether that's a continuing, you know, this way or this way, whatever, right. you, or if it's going to level out, you know, or whether there'll be a resurgence in the <coughs> other direction. Like, I feel like the, we still don't know. We don't know. One, one thing that, you know, that's, that some of us think might happen is that um, the books that, you know, really popular books, the, the bestsellers, that they're all going to go electronic. It's like it's the old, you know, the old paperbacks, the old mass market paperbacks. Those those hardly exist anymore because people who would be cycling through a, a cheap paperback, you know, and just sort of going through them as they as they, um, you know, every every time they come out, uh, and not necessarily saving them, maybe even you know trashing them. Those people read electronic books now. But if you fetishize the book, the beautiful book, then then you're more likely, to, you know. To, to buy hardcovers, for example. So some of us think that the sort of the, the precious literary books are going to stay around as fetishized objects, perhaps become even more expensive and become more like collector's items. Um, and you know, the, I mean, that that's that's one guess. But, yeah. um, I, you know. I think that's happening now already. Um, the uh, electronic book sales are extremely high in romance novels and mystery novels because those are toss away books. You don't want to keep those. And the publishers are putting a lot of effort into the art of the book or the book as art. And you really see magnificent covers out now on, on literary books. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 
So they are trying. So what do each of you from your differing perspectives see a reader wanting from a book? And you know, a book or you could interpret the question as a story, however you want. What's, can we start on your end, Anna? Because then we'll mix it up um, a little. It's, you know, it depends who the reader is because, you know, the, the, the books that, that I represent mostly traditionally don't sell very many copies. And I'm talking about literary fiction. And the, the real challenge, and I'm always looking, if you, if you count me as a reader, I'm always looking for something that, that's fresh, that's different, that I haven't, that I haven't seen before. You know that that um, that changes the way I think about what fiction is, even, and and changes the you know the, the the reading experience of reading fiction. Some of those books also are are fun to read and page turner. Some of them aren't. Some of them are you know dark and gritty and depressing, and um, and probably have an audience of two thousand people. So the challenge now is to figure out. It used to be that. You know, if you had an audience of 2,000 people, well, you knew which publisher, you know, could reach that audience. There's there are very few publishers, commercial publishers, who can take that risk anymore, or who can afford to to anticipate only to selling 2,000 copies. And that means that the in, the role of the independent publisher, small independent publisher, has become much more important in the last even the, in the last year, I would say. Um, the you know the uh, the literary novel that I, I send out today, let's say to 20 publishers, I can, I can count on 10, 15 of them calling me within the week, breathless, saying, I love this, I love this, I'm getting other reads. When it comes time for an auction, I can count on maybe two or three of them being allowed to make an offer. Because there, you know, that there's, um, there, there are just, there, there's sort of no, stop, no, at every, at every turn. Their publisher can see that they won't sell enough copies. The sales force can see they won't sell enough copies. The marketing person thinks, well, you know, we've done a book like this before, and it just, the, the, there's no, you know, we couldn't do anything for it. The publicity person says the same. So, um, uh, so you know, from my perspective, what a reader wants, um, if you're talking about sort of the the common reader, is very different from what I want as a reader, <laughs> and that's and that's you know that's a real challenge. Um, as you're talking, I'm thinking, uh, on the way up here to this event, I ran into Mary Gordon in the elevator, mm -hmm. who I had a, as a professor here, and um, she's a novelist and wrote many books. Um, and we were talking about the topic of this event, and, and she said, you know, the problem isn't publishing, the problem is reading. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people, I mean, I know what I want as a reader. I want good, honest, you know, a, a an honest voice and you know the courage to write differently. I don't want to constantly be reading in the same style and the same voice. Um, but it seems like you know readers um, are looking f for different things. I mean, most people who are reading are not looking for literary fiction. Um, that's a minority, um, and so I, I think the reader that. I, my writing kind of gears to, um, is looking for, like I said, you know, a really strong voice of an author. That's constantly what we had, um, you know, going on in conversations as a Barnard student, um, you know, analyzing literature and writing. Um, and, and that's still what I look for and what I try to write for. So, um, but I, I I do think it's kind of a dwindling audience. This panel is so depressing. I know. <laughs> I know. Okay, so I'm going to tell you that for 13 years, 15 years, I dreamed of readers. And now, for the past, it'll be two weeks tomorrow, I've finally gotten to hear from them. And, you know, it, of course, they're not a representative sample because they're small and the book's only been out two weeks. Hopefully, one day there'll be more. But, the emails that I get from people that, you know, really get my heart going. I got one the other day and she said, I'm disliking, I'm sort of disliking my kids right now because they're keeping me from your book. Uh, and and that, that's what I hope readers want and that's what I hope I can write, you know, a story that 
you just don't want to put down. I've always thought, we talked about this at Margot's bookstore once, literary versus genre fiction, real difference or no distinction at all. And I'm not naive. I know there's a difference. And I know there's the kind of book that is going to speak to 2,000 readers. And But I think at the end of the day, what a reader wants is to be swept away and, and taken into a story that is going to transform them or transform their life for a little while. And the other thing that I hope readers want, and it seems to me like they might want, is, <clears throat> you know, somebody asked why crime fiction, why suspense, and my novel is, is kind of, they call it, my publisher calls it a literary thriller, um, although one author was very irate when he saw that he blurbed me, but he, he said, don't call it a literary thriller, that, that you don't have the right to call it that, and neither does your publisher. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> um, Sounds like a good one. <laughs> <laughs> good story. Um, but, you know, the other thing that I think of is that you know, that we live in a world where there are really horrible tragedies that we have to all think about or have in the stratosphere, you know, around us every day. And, and, and then some people, unfortunately, much worse than that. And so one thing that I think reading offers and some readers want is a place where even if things don't come out okay at the end, things, you understand why they didn't. You know, and that there's a, a sense in some books of the world just being an understandable phenomenon, and I think we really lack that. You know, humans always have, and that a good story can, can give us that, and I think readers mm -hmm. want that. So I, one of the perks of my job is that I get to travel across the country with authors and go to schools and kind of see kids clamoring for books, which is really positive and encouraging. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I'm talking to my friends or when I'm talking to a seven-year-old, when I ask what they want from a book, they say a great story. Um, and, you know, and comfort too, you know. Um, I personally, like whenever I am going through a difficult time or I'm stressed, like I turn to my old favorite Jane Austen book and that to me is comfort. Um, and I think a combination of comfort and quality and knowing that the author endeavored to do something to make you think about either your life or maybe what's not going on in your life, but that provoking thought I think is what um, readers most want from a book and also I think readers want um, a good sense of what the author is like too um, I think that kids are always curious what an author is like um, and you know like how old are you or <laughs> they ask these really kind of adorable questions but they're really curious and um, even now like as an adult I still have that curiosity I love going um, to different bookstores and meeting authors and being, not asking how old they are, <laughs> but just kind of getting to see that they're like real people because I forget, you know, like, wow, like my favorite story was written by someone. Like they thought of this idea. Like that's really cool. So that's my positive <laughs> assessment. I, I think there are, there are still positives. We, we have a, um, a lot of kids who come in, and this is not um, just for the mass market books, but there are kids who come in, they know the day a book is released, they come rushing in, they, I mean, it, it's amazing that they're so excited, you're just, your heart melts. But um, I think, I'm like kind of confused which question we're on, but I guess it's about what do, like readership. What do you readership. think a reader wants from a book? A reader, I, I, I think readers want, I mean, a wide range, coming from comfort to being challenged to learning to... Uh, wanting to escape mm -hmm. uh, we and I think the one thing I've learned over all the years is not to make a judgment on what readers want uh, this summer Gone Girl and Fifty Shades of Grey kept the doors open they you know I was able to turn on the lights every single day but that allowed me to sell the one or two copies of the books that sell 2,000 copies altogether Give them a plug. What were they? <laughs> which one the I was just trying to think because sometimes we do only sell one copy of a book and or there are books that I I, mean, I love the um, what was it under the banyan tree I really thought that would take off it I thought it was beautifully written it was a fascinating story I got lost in it I learned about um, Cambodia which I you know didn't know anything about and we said I don't care how much I plugged it it's not what people wanted to read this summer they wanted to escape mm -hmm. but you know, I got to know that book, and when it comes out in paperback, it'll that'll be a really big book for us. Mm -hmm. But you know, so I've learned not not to judge, but to try to try to 
try to interest people or try to find the books, listen to them, listen to what they want, and then match them up with the right book. I got the long question. <laughs> <laughs> There's a tension in the industry today that is reflected in the participants sitting up here. On the one hand, bookstores are tied to a convergence a convergence of cultural trends, locavorism, so supporting your community, unplugging, slow reading. On, um, on the other, the elephant in the room has allowed self-publishing to reach new heights and writers who might otherwise not have been heard to flourish. Is there a positive outcome possible for all? Yeah, who wants Big. to take it? <laughs> Um, you take it. Sure, I can. Um, I think uh, I think there is um, there are some possible outcomes that are good for um, many parties. Um, as a self-published author, I know that you know even though I did go through Amazon, um, I had to. I, I was in touch with so many local places, so many local bookstores, and and newspapers, like publications. I mean, I used to write for a local newspaper in my, um, in my town of, in, in Rockland County, and I, they were one of the first people I reached out to, you know, to kind of publicize and kind of plug my book. Um, so I found it not such a depersonalized um, endeavor where it was just Amazon and then you send your book out into like <laughs> into the wild on the internet and that's it um, but it was more interacting with people that I knew and and tapping on lots of local resources so it was it has been a nice like intimate um, experience in some ways where you just reach out to your local um, you know, independent businesses, and 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 you all kind of gain from each other's success. So. <coughs> Excuse me. I would say that um, that both of these both of these trends, which seem to be sort of opposites in opposite directions, um, and there's obviously a tension there, are they're both reactions to the same thing, which is the way Amazon has affected the industry and our lives. So um, the one is, is, I think, much more obvious, um, you know, which is the sort of reaction to, to everything going electronic and, and this, you know, people sort of reclaiming the Main Street and reclaiming the idea of sort of going to their local bookstores and all of that. Uh, the other is less obvious, but I think it's, it's also a reaction and it's more roundabout that, you know, there's always vanity publishing. I mean, people have always published, you know, self-published. Um, but now, it's you know it's so it's so easy to do, and now there's that. But on the other hand, it's so difficult to to get an agent or a publisher because of the ease of you know of email and all of these things. We're flooded flooded with queries. I mean, I I don't know how many I get a day, but I was just thinking. You know, th there are all of these manuscripts I'll never read, and I'm missing. You know, I'm missing out on 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 so many good books. But I, I have to, as it is, I can never keep up, and so I have to keep what I read to what I'm basically obligated to read. You know, so um, uh, so I think you know it's kind of a, it's a similar. It's a it's also a reaction to things going electronic and to. Um, and, and in an even this might sound kind of far out, but the way that publishers have had to react to Amazon and to and and the fact that that the it's much harder for them to sell books that are a little bit more challenging, a little bit more difficult, means that publishers have become I don't want to say more discerning because I think they become less discerning in some ways, but that they they they're all looking for for the, the next bestseller and therefore turning away from sometimes more interesting books. That also drives people to sell directly to Amazon. Um, so, uh, so I would say the cause of all of, of these, you know, the, these different offshoots is, is all, uh, you know, again, Amazon, <laughs> 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 which, by the way, I boycott. Uh, um, <clears throat> so I'll give a plug for New York Writers Workshop, where I teach writing and publishing. And when I do teach it, I say that there are three 
uh, viable publishing paths now. And we've talked about all of them. So there's publishing with a major house. There used to be the big six. Soon it's going to be the big five. It may be the big four, bef right, before um, another year is out. There are independent presses, which Anna mentioned, and more every day. And the flip side to that is that many of the independent presses that are newer um, may not last or stay around, you know, even for the time for a book to be published. I have students where that happened. And then there's self-publishing, as we did. And I really do think that each of them has its pros and cons. I don't see them in a hierarchy. Um, and the reason I hung out for so long hoping for uh, the major house was really because I, for me, the physical space, the bookstores and the bricks and mortar and the libraries are such an important part of, of being a writer. But not everybody feels that way. And also, self-publishing can sometimes be an entry into that, you know, because your book does well and then maybe an agent comes calling or an editor comes calling. Um, if I were going to make one prediction, and I really hesitate to, and this could easily not happen, but it would be that the trend we're talking about, locavorism, and there's going to be kind of a hyper-locality that's, that's going to take root and that it may help you know, bring some of these together so that maybe the small independent bookstore will be able to work with the local author. I mean, I see it happening now. And for the past three years, I've driven back and forth across the country visiting bookstores. And you know, almost everyone we stopped at had a local author shelf. And these were self-published authors, but they had made, built a relationship with their local bookseller. And because they were supporting the bookstore and emphasizing its place in their lives, the bookstore was willing to emphasize their place in its life. And it was a really nice kind of you know, weaving together. So I think there could be a very positive outcome. I think we need some years to sort it out. Um, I bristle when independently published authors say, I went into my you know, five local bookstores with my books, and I just don't know why they didn't just take it. They're, what's the big deal? You put it on the shelf. I, I really do have you know, this much understanding of what a proposition it is to try to deal with the content that Anna was talking about and how much there is. But I think that if everybody really focuses on writing a, a really good book that needs to be read and that finds readers, there are always going to be readers for it. And that, I think, is the most positive outcome of all. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, I can only speak to my experience working for a publishing house, um, but I would um, venture to say that as long as the content is good and, you know, authors have and in, make an investment in their work and in their reader as well, there's going to be a positive outcome for that author. Um, I find that like people who are really passionate about writing tend to find their way, whatever that may be, um, and there are many viable paths now, and I just kind of work for one of those viable paths. I think I uh, agree with what you were saying, Jenny, that I think eventually there will be some, if not a merging, but a uh, sort of a comfortable uh, relationship, more comfortable relationship. I mean, I can only speak from uh, the bookselling point of view. Our role as a, as a bookstore is now more of a community center, a place where, I mean, Jenny uh, developed this fabulous program uh, called Writing Matters, which has, we, we're, we are, have a, write, a writer heavy community. And every other month, it, it was a really important uh, gathering of writers with panel discussions that, you know, it was not a book selling experience at all, but it was a really important uh, place. And it was our place to have it, I think, to have that discussion. And, uh, and the same, yeah. I think also in the age of electronics, people are so isolated that they need to come to a place where they can talk to someone. And uh, even if it's just exchange a few pleasant words, uh, have, a, 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 have a conversation at the counter with another customer about a book. Uh, you know, so many, everybody's gotten very jaded about book reviews online that they're, you know, placed there, they're, you know, they're, they're not genuine. And you want to have a genuine conversation with, with someone about what, what they liked. And you can you're judge, you know who the person is you're talking to, and you can figure out whether that is a recommendation you want to take or not. It's not uh, in this anonymous thing. So I feel like we're, we're offering the non-anonymous. <laughs> yeah, the face-to-face. -face. Yep. <clears throat> uh, 
questions. Next question is, what is the most difficult part of your job today, and what's the most joyous? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can you guess what the most difficult part is? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you, uh, just to give you an anecdote why, uh, of, of why, um, and, and not even related to all the other things I, I've, I've said about Amazon. Um, I had a book that uh, hit the bestseller list this summer, um, and uh, and you know, it was doing incredibly well. And then all of a sudden, we noticed that Amazon was saying that they they were were only able I don't know to ship in the next three weeks, and that, you know, little by little, it looked like Amazon was running out of copies. Without going into too much detail, it was basically off of Amazon. They took down the, the buy button. It was basically <gasps> off Amazon for two or three weeks. Just at the point where it had hit the bestseller list, it was being reviewed absolutely everywhere. Um, it was simply very difficult to find. Um, of course, then people could go to barnesandnobles.com, but they soon ran out as well. Um, you could go to your local bookstore, but if you were um, on either coast, uh, books were likely to be gone as well. Now, we can blame the publisher for this, and I do blame the publisher for this, but it's actually the mechanism of how the industry works right now. So, in order to get books reprinted and sent to Amazon, first of all, you, you can only print basically what's been ordered. If you print more than that, then you have to house them in a warehouse, and, and nobody does this anymore. So. And there's also a concern about returns, because if you print more books than are already ordered, then they might be returned, and that looks bad on paper, and then everybody's in trouble. So, uh, so, so, the, so the books get printed, and supposedly, if you have a bestseller, that's going to be a priority at the printer. They're going to put them in front of the queue. Well, sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, sometimes somebody doesn't make a phone call, whatever it is, or they're printing, you know, the next uh, Grisham or the next, you know, whatever it is. Um, and uh, so, so that's, that's the first step. And then getting the books from the printer to you know, Amazon. Or first they go back to the publisher's warehouse. So they sit there. And then they get shipped out to Amazon and the booksellers. Well, Amazon only allowed shipments on Tuesdays and Fridays, let's say. I think it's different days for different publishers. So if they finally get the books in the warehouse, you know, Monday evening or Tuesday morning, then they can't even go to Amazon, land in Amazon, and let's say you know, Amazon will open the door for them maybe on Friday. So mm -hmm. the, the buy button isn't gonna, and then they have to get processed. So the buy button isn't even gonna be back up until the next week. That explains why it takes two to three weeks for a bestseller, which is sold out, to get back onto Amazon. And this is a system that you know, nobody, nobody knows how to fix. And no publisher is talking about it. There aren't any you know, New York Times articles about it because it all it makes them all look bad. Also, you know, you have a, a book that's working really well and everyone's excited about it. You don't want to give it bad press. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is my least favorite part of the job: the fact that this industry has no idea how to how to sell, you know, how to get books from point A to point B anymore. Um, the most joyous part of my job. There's so many of them, but discovering something new, um, sharing it with. Uh, sharing it with publishers and finding that they're as excited as I am. Um, and, and then you know, seeing it go out into the world and seeing you know, reviewers and, and readers just get excited. <coughs> I mean, there's, just, there's no bigger joy, so, and that's still there. Um, my favorite part is still writing. <laughs> um, I mean, that's obviously why I wrote and, and continued to write and um, and the the hardest I think is publicizing um, I mean definitely um, as a self-published author I, I don't have you know a built-in team um, who's gonna like help publicize so if my you know momentum runs out um, then it just stops there um, so yeah, I mean, it, just to keep myself motivated, um, that's that's a challenge. But you know, I, I do, um, I, I still, you know, just enjoy the fact that I enjoy the writing helps me enjoy that aspect as well. So I agree that the writing is is definitely the joy, and just getting to sit down in the morning and go to a different world is such a privilege. Um, <clears throat> I never thought I would be able to, you know, do this, be allowed, or be in 
title to do this. So <clears throat> that's a huge joy. Um, I'm not in a place where I really know. I mean, the difficult part was certainly getting published, um, you know, and it took forever, and there were a lot of give up moments, and um, it was definitely my husband who kind of never let me stop trying and just always said there's no plan b and so you do this till it happens with that difficult part out there I, yeah i mean right now it's just it's just fun um so the most difficult part of my job is also potentially the most joyous um so i basically want to find audiences for readers so a lot of times that means pitching to media and if you have a really niche book um, you kind of have to be creative in terms of how you position it um, or who you send it to. Um, and that can be kind of vexing when you're staring at a blank screen trying to think, who's going to want to read this? Who's going to enjoy this? Um, but there's no better feeling than picking up a press clip of like the book that you have loved and read and you love the author and seeing it reviewed positively or seeing them take away something different that you might not have taken. Um, I think the most joyous part of my day is talking about books with my colleagues. Um, what I see as, you know, what a type of book like was to me can be completely different from what my friend at work says. Like what I think is a coming of age story, she could think is completely different. And I find those interactions like really rewarding um, and kind of what I like dreamed about when I was at Barnard, you know, talking about books all day with people. Like that's actually what I do and it's pretty <laughs> awesome. So. Um, the most difficult part of my job is uh, remaining relevant, remaining relevant to publishers, remaining relevant to readers. Um, but the the best parts of my job is a sense of discovery. Like I feel like you're constantly reading that book, that book that I don't know just takes you away, and that you want to hand to every single person that walks in that you love so much. And uh, the other uh, best part is helping to grow new readers. I, I think the, the, the best challenge is not just the first grader who's reading at an eighth grade level, <laughs> which we have a lot of, <laughs> but, but that, that's a challenge to find a book that they will enjoy and love and does not have inappropriate material for them. But the other one is, you know, those reluctant readers, the kids who just don't want to read anything besides a cereal box and introducing them to an author that changes their world. So that's my favorite part. Faith, how are we doing for time? Should we, are we good? Um, yeah, open it. Should we take, um, I don't know, do you guys, do you want to take the next question and, and maybe combine the, um, the next two, Margo? Do you see they agree or disagree? Because those kind of yeah. go together. Wait a minute, just to, to agree or disagree, it's a better time than ever to be a writer? Yeah, but maybe a reader too. Yeah, I was going to say, I, is it a better time to be a reader? Uh, that's a really good question because I thought um, what you brought up Anna, about um, the publishers are more discerning and yet they're not. It's some, some, w from our perspective, I feel like sometimes the publishers, no, the, the publishers just want to make a buck. And okay, this book worked, and then for the next year and a half, all I get are proposals for the same friggin' book. I, it's like, we already read this book, we love this book, let's move on. We don't need copycat books. And um, so that is, uh, but, and I don't know about being a writer, I would think it would be extremely frustrating to be a writer. Yeah, as a writer of press releases, yes. it's extremely stressful. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I'm like the best person to answer this, but I'll answer as a reader. Um, and I think it's an awesome time to be a reader. Um, I have so many books on my nightstand, some from Scholastic, some from my friends at other houses. And I just, like every night after work, immerse myself in books um, and just how many books there are and how many great books there are is really encouraging. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess I'm like the Pollyanna of this panel. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it's a great time to be a reader. I think it's a great time to work in publishing. So, you know, yay. Yeah. <laughs> a 
I mean, I think after 13 years, I'm pretty polyanalytic too. And probably, I mean, I was all those years too, and that's what mm -hmm. kept me in it, that I really believed the system could work. But I do think it's a better time than ever to be a writer because, you know, Anna mentioned there was always self-publishing. But it's true. It used to be called vanity publishing. And the reason for that is with my... Um, former writing group uh, partner, member, a guy named Pete, who felt that he should self-publish his novel before there was any e-reading devices or anything like that. He had to print uh, 5,000 copies. Talk about, you know, Random House doesn't want a warehouse. This was Pete warehousing. And he did decide to print 5,000 copies. And then the Vanity Press talked him into doing a hard cover as opposed to a soft cover. And it's called Vanity for a reason. So he, Pete had $60,000. <laughs> True, worth of hardcovers that he couldn't sell. Now, you know, if you decide that you want to explore the publishing waters by publishing on your own, or you're a bat, you know, you're a writer with a backlist, an author with a backlist, and you want to bring those titles back to your reading public. I know many authors who are doing it that way. You know, there's just more opportunities, and yet, although Anna points out that it's greatly constricted, there's still a very viable traditional publishing path, and I would say that, you know. Maybe hardcovers will go only toward <laughs> literary books as sort of art objects, but I can certainly say from my perspective that my publisher did decide to bring my book out in hardcover. It is definitely not a literary novel, and they have lavished love on it. I mean, they've been so wonderful to it. My publicist, you know, I have two publicists that I'm working with. I mean, they have been fantastic, and so... I'd be surprised if, if that doesn't remain a viable path along the other viable paths. And that's good news for a writer and good news for a reader because it means there's no more content, although finding it, you know, is, is the subject of another panel. Uh, I have a lot to say about both. Um, I, I think it's always been kind of difficult to be a writer. I mean, you hear of all these writers who were never discovered until like after years and years of writing. And now you do have more um, options. You have the option that's, um, like we said, of self-publishing, which I, I did. And, um, but it's, it's hard. It's hard to be a reader because of that, because there's just so much out there, and it's difficult to trust, um, you know, the content. I mean, because everybody and their uncle can self-publish, you know, you don't know what's good and what's not. And um, so I think, but but the flip side, you know, as a writer is that, I mean, I was telling Anna before, um, for you know, the months after I graduated, I mean. I, I tried like sending queries out and didn't hear back and it just felt like everything was being sent out into the void and it was just it felt pointless so then people started talking to me about hey you know publishing could be self-publishing could be a way in you know um, and I think we've we've mentioned that briefly but um, so so suddenly you have this different avenue of kind of becoming a writer and, I mean, becoming a published um, author. And so it, it, I think it's better um, than it ever was to actually, to be a writer. Um, the hard thing is, you know, <laughs> there are so many distractions nowadays when it comes to the actual, you know, act of writing, um, but that's, that's separate from publishing. I think in terms of publishing, you know, there are so many options and the difficult part comes in just choosing <laughs> and knowing what's best for you. Well, if you're the Pollyanna like panel, <laughs> wouldn't that make me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would say, I mean, there's never there's never a bad time to be a reader. Of course, it's a great time to be a reader, but in a way, it's kind of the worst time to be a reader because if you don't have access, you know, how 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 do we find the books that we read? You know, it, they. There's now sort of, you know, my job is to curate. A publisher's job is to curate. Um, reviews are supposed to curate. Those forms are now, those forms of, 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 helping, of helping readers find what's quality and what's good are, you know, they're slowly fading away. So, you know, there are very few book reviews anymore. The book reviews that there are, like the New York Times book review kind of gives you a summary of a book but it doesn't really tell you anything. They're not, it's not fun to read. Um, you know, and, and publishers are, you know, the, 
the big five, or the student to be the big four, publishers, they're curating, but they're not really curating because they're so nervous about their numbers, they're always fighting the last war. You know, as you said, they're, they're always just trying to publish what's worked already. So they're not finding you anything new and exciting. Um, now there are publishers who, who are doing that, you know, and if you have access, if you know, for example, if you see a Europa cover, it's probably going to be it's probably going to be pretty good, or, or at least a little different. Um, you know, if you if you know if you know enough to look for what a, a certain publisher is doing, you might have an idea that you know you'd prefer to buy an FSG book to a Random House book. You know, but but most people don't look at publishers, and so how do you you know? How do you figure out what you're going to read? Maybe a friend tells you, but how does that friend know? Probably because it was well displayed in the Barnes and Nobles. Well, that display area was paid for by the publisher. It's called co-op. So that wasn't really curated either, unless you think of the publisher as curating. So needless to say, you know, yeah, I think it's probably a bad time to be a reader because there's just so much thrown at you, and the traditional roots of curating have kind of, are falling away. <laughs> I, I thought with co-op it was a joint arrangement between Barnes and Noble and the publisher. Well, in order, in order to pay for that co-op, you have to, you know, you have to. They have, right. they have to want it. Right, 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 right. Yeah, it's like supermarket yeah. placement. You pay yeah. for it, and right. But I thought Barnes and Noble was curating to a certain extent that they that they are that there's a sign off between Barnes and Noble has to like a publisher can't just go with any title and pay for it. That, there has to be some. That's thing. right. That is right. Yeah. Okay. How are we gonna? Okay. What's the last question? Who gets to? Oh, I know. Okay. Are you asking it, Emma? I am. Yes, and I'm answering it as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, if there are people in the audience hoping to enter your line of work, what three tips would you give them? Okay. I have to condense my list down to three. Um, <laughs> Mine, my first one would be to keep an open mind, um, which sounds like really zen and, you know, <laughs> um, but, you know, I was like a pretty picky, I was much more picky of a reader when I was in college and high school and I kind of had this like snobbish air. Um, and now, you know, by virtue of my job, I read a lot. And I think, you know, I had preconceived notions of like what my taste was, of what I liked, but I mean, I really like everything so I mean there's some things that are not like something I'm going to put on my nightstand but I really have been surprised by books that I would not be attracted to really liking and I think it's important to kind of just you know really kind of take a taste of what's out there even if you think it's not for you because it might be for your friend or it might be for your sister or you know it might just be good to know like what's going on in the cultural conversation um, and then my second tip would be to um, kind of do whatever it takes, like to not think that anything is beneath you um, and to not take anyone for granted um, and just to be polite. Um, people always comment with my group of people like how nice we are to each other and they really appreciate that like we don't call and scream at people on the phone and I mean, I don't really, I don't know like in other industries if that's the norm, but that's like not what we do. Um, so people are really appreciative of that. Um, and then my third tip would be networking. Um, in addition to working at Scholastic, I'm also a board member of Young to Publishing, um, and we are like you know the main publishing houses plus smaller ones, and we host events, um, and it's really great. And you know you think it'd be kind of awkward like being in a room with like people from different houses who virtually have nothing in common except for their job, but it's actually really that is like a bonding experience, um, and I found that really kind of instructive, um, and it's also a great way to get free books, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could be better. Um, so my number one tip, if you want to be a writer, however you decide to publish, is to hone your craft. And <clears throat> don't, don't, you, you can't do it enough. My book sold in its 18th draft. It was my eighth novel, although it's my debut novel. It is now, when the published form is its 22nd draft, there are people right here in this room who can attest to how <clears throat> how far before I actually got published I would have thought that I was ready to be published. And I think you cannot <clears throat> you cannot get enough readers and you cannot get enough, you know, you'll reach a point where maybe you have too many, but I think that point is far beyond what most writers think it is. Certainly for me, I would have thought that it was done much sooner than it was. 
So hone your craft. Um, know the industry so that, you know, when, when you go to events like this and you hear self-publishing or small press publishing or major house publishing, you have a sense of which would be right for you. I think that there's no right path. It's just a question of what kind of book are you writing? What kind of person are you? Do you love the marketing aspect and being on your own? Are you willing to give up the control that comes when you, your novel becomes, you know, a team with a team behind it and a joint effort? And I don't even mean creative control, but I mean things like um, what time of year your book comes out and what the title is, 50% of the time publishers, major publishers anyway, change the title. And you know, is that gonna feel like a fun collaboration to you or are you gonna be clawing your hair out? If so, you might wanna publish independently. And um, then my third tip is, is really Pollyanna and it's just don't give up on your dream. If this is what you wanna do, it will happen. You just, you know, until you stop trying, you haven't failed, you just haven't succeeded yet. Um, I'm also doing some condensing of my list. Um, <laughs> I, I think the first thing, um, the first thing I definitely want to say is that you should, you know, write from your gut. Um, I I had a professor actually at Barnard who told us that um, the the writing that ends up being really great and treasured is the writing that you know people didn't just want to write or think was a good idea to write but that they really needed to write and I've tried to keep that in mind I mean I've been writing ever since I was really little but um, <laughs> when he said that it was just kind of yeah I mean everyone says oh this would be fun to write about especially now that people know um, that I'm a writer I mean they constantly say like oh this would be a great character and there are so many things that you can write about I mean the world is full of very rich topics but it's the things that really burn in you that end up being the most enjoyable writing experience um, first of all but also um, the most salient and the most um, the, the most fun to read as readers. Um, so also, um, well, I would say stay close with, you know, your communities. Um, I mean, I love like the Barnard community, for example, and if you are a Barnard student or alumna, um, I mean, it's a great kind of network and um, just, meeting other Barnard alumni and um, being in events like this is just such a rich addition to any um, kind of career. So, especially in writing, I mean, to me, um, it's been amazing. Um, <laughs> this is just kind of sad, but um, get a day job. <laughs> um, and I mean that, you know, both in like the funny kind of don't depend on, you know, being the next great American um, author, you know, not just as a humility play, but more so that you don't have to be a slave to the industry. Um, you know, if you are depending on just writing and, you know, and like you have no other option, I, on the one hand, it, it makes it more urgent for you and more passionate, but also I think you end up having to just write whatever people need you to write or what people will buy. And and that's been one of the reasons I'm I'm thankful that, you know not thankful. I mean I that's that I chose um to have kind of go for two careers. I mean writing and, and I'm in um, graduate school for psychology, but um I, I just know that I would be pulling my hair out if I had to make a living off of writing because I don't write what, you know, like is going to sell thousands and thousands of copies and I know that and, and the reason I enjoy writing is because I get to write the way I like it. So I guess, I guess I'm the perfect um, independent <laughs> publisher because I just can't, you know, uh, I'll write what I enjoy and that's the only reason I do it, so. So um, I guess um, my first piece of advice is if you wanted to go into agenting, um, and I would advise against it, but if you wanted to go into agenting, <laughs> say read as much as you can in your, you know, in, in your area, um, 
if it's if it's fiction, read as much contemporary fiction as you can. Read what's on the bestseller list, but also you know read uh, you know the, the the books that the your local bookseller um, is excited about, um, so that you can be current in what's working and what's not working and what you like and don't like. Which leads me to my second piece of advice, which is to be confident in your taste. There might be um, you know a book that everyone absolutely you know seems everyone seems to to adore and you read it and you're kind of bored by it and you don't like it very much uh, you know stick by that opinion and 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 when you read manuscripts and you fall in love with something you'll know it and you don't have to second guess yourself and when you send it out into the world and it's turned down and turned down to they're wrong you're right and that's really the only way to, I think, survive as an agent is to be is to be confident in your own taste, um, because otherwise you you'll always be second guessing yourself. And my third piece of advice is to have a trust fund. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those of you who want to open up a bookstore, as I'm sure there are many of you. Uh, first piece of advice is you've got to have passion. You've got to absolutely love what you're doing, what you're reading, that this is how, uh, what, what you want to bring forth into the world or books. Second, you need to be a people person because essentially you are building a community for people and you need to connect. And third, uh, you need to be a business person because you're paying bills and it just comes down to that. And a trust fund helps. <laughs> <laughs> Trust ones always help. Yes, they always help. <laughs> um, I'm kind of curious here? about the audience. Yeah, like why, why, why did you come? Are you are these aspiring writers? Are we? What are we? Just love the publishing industry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'm a writer too. Um, I started writing when I was in college, and I was like, this is intimidating. <laughs> Um, I'm a writer and um, I've heard both sides of the perspective um, of publishing and um, I noticed that it's coming into my writing and that's a bad feeling. Like I sit down at the page and instead of the joy and the passion that's been with me since I was a child, now I'm thinking, but there won't be an audience, but there won't be an audience, but there won't be an and, and there's no there's no more Barnes and Noble behind me. I grew up with Barnes and Noble, so I, I love that. But um, there's no one more. This so this this um, dialogue is really inundating my head sometimes as I sit down and write. And I wanted to know the facts. And thank you so much for bringing us, bringing me your experience. And now I can go out into the world and more judiciously look at some of the things that I can do and some of the ways to quiet that voice when it starts raging. Um, it's really good to know that there are still options. That's why sometimes maybe what you're saying, Anna, seems like the world is shutting down to publishing, but indeed maybe there are new options. And e-reading can survive along with the paper um, option and so on and so on. Thank you. <laughs> it seems like it, and there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal actually a couple of weeks ago that you know, just Google it, and it was about where e-readers are versus print, you know, reading, and how it was really pretty much, you know, leveling out. And you know, Google it; it'll come up. First, I would really love to hear the titles of the books that you wrote and um, your bestseller that you uh, were the agent for, and. Um, the having best seller. Having met you, your best seller. Okay. Having met the three of you, um, it would be nice to uh, no, to pursue your uh, material. But um, I think there is a parallel between uh, the publishing, what's happening with the publishing industry, and what's happening to other industries around us. Uh, we see the big boxes taking over and controlling us. And um, we're, we're, we, we don't know where to turn. But we see that in other industries also. For instance, uh, restaurants. We have big box restaurants. But yet in New York City, millions of small, 
small places where people are cooking and people are coming in to taste and spreading to Brooklyn and spreading to the outer boroughs. People are still hungry. <laughs> people are hungry. And people are not only hungry for food, I think people are hungry for knowledge. And they're hungry to read. And um, very importantly, they are hungry to connect over ideas. And um, the market definitely exists. It's just that the approaches to the market, what we're talking about here in the panel, have, are, are falling apart. Um, as a Barnard English major and a tremendous lover of books since I was able to read at age two, maybe, I bring people together over books. We call them book clubs. And um, I have many book clubs where um, sometimes men and sometimes women come together in homes and read material and talk about the material. And I know that one of the book clubs is going to your bookstore next oh. month, as a matter of fact. And pe people love that. They disagree. They all choose different books. Certainly literary fiction finds one audience and mass market book club type fiction is another circle of readers, but that doesn't matter. And um, I think that if anybody has a passion for books and for reading, that they should seek out circles of people who are reading. And then the hunger will um, make publishing and writing and reading survive. I think so, and I think also, you know, when you talk about slow reading, there's also slow eating, and I think the unifying thing is creativity, and that, yes, there's Olive Garden, and <coughs> you always know what kind of tomato sauce you're going to get, but I think human beings, not just in New York City, I mean, we have traveled the country back and forth, are hungry for the unique, and the unique does come from a unique literary voice. I want to know who your best seller was, too. Um, <laughs> And the unique comes from the restaurant that maybe only has 12 tables, but they're booked six months in advance. So my title is Cover of Snow. Cover of Snow. Snow. Yes. Great title. Mine is The Gods She Chose. Where'd you go, Bernadette? Oh, oh, oh my God. That's a huge seller. That's such a good book. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I even have a postcard yeah. if you really want it because <laughs> I have some here. So in answer to your question about why I'm here at least, it's that I work at Book of the Month Club and the question of what is going to happen to the world of publishing is what I wake up every morning wondering and go to sleep every <laughs> night wondering and all of the hours of the day in between. Um, so my question to you is um, as authors and as uh, non-authors, it seems to me like the author's ability or willingness or skill in participating in the promotion of their own books is becoming one of the most important factors that goes into whether or not a book sells. And that makes me, as you know, a bleeding heart liberal Barnard woman, you know, I just think like the access to social graces and skills and charm and stuff did not always have to be at the center of being a successful author. And it sort of makes me feel a little freaked out. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that change in the author's role in their own art, uh, just from your own points of view. I was just gonna uh, say that as an outsider, non-author, I find it the hardest marriage of skills because to write is a solitary, self, you know, self-involved, hiding in a corner, creating, and then promotion is a circus, and you've got to be out there and z zazz people up, and it's true, you have to sell your own book, so I find it the biggest struggle uh, to, to watch authors go through this, and... Well, for some encouragement, um, basically when we work with authors, we never want to make them uncomfortable. So like if you've never used Twitter before, I'm not going to say, get a Twitter, tweet all the time. Blah, blah. Like that just wouldn't be organic and it wouldn't be, you know, if your heart's not in social media, like that's that doesn't have to be what your prowess is in promoting your book. You might write a thoughtful blog post that your publicist or you 
you know, put out into the world that can eloquently describe what you think about writing more so than a 240 character tweet. Um, so I think there's like a common misconception that authors need to be like promotional machines, but I mean, that's not the case. Like you should not feel forced to do that. Um, I like I would never be able to do that, so I can't expect you know like someone I'm working with. To but that's what people respond to. They want you know someone who interviews well. Yeah. You know that's that's how you learn about the author. That's true. But we can. I mean, there's if you you know if you have a publicist at a you know a house like you know we do like mock interviews and. You know, or we'll arrange an event that caters to you and your strengths and your audience. Um, you, like for some authors, they do much better with kids. Like, so we'll put them in a school in conjunction with the bookstore and like that's their niche. They're totally comfortable. Um, and it's really kind of like a flexible, um, from our end, we try and make it as pleasant as possible. But at the same time, with the goal of like getting your book out to the right people. So you shouldn't. Um, first of all, I love Book of the Month Club. Thank you. Um, and second of all, I completely agree with Emma. I actually am waiting for a study to be done about this because I think it's one of the big myths of the industry that authors who are social media um, forces, um, you know, ounce for ounce, if you did a large scale study, if those authors would do better with their books. And without telling any tales out of school, I can tell you that one of the biggest bestsellers, let's just say within the last two years, so you can't pinpoint it, the author is, a, a, by all accounts, a truly horrific person to talk with, to, and the book did phenomenally. And you can't, I mean, one of the things I guess I didn't get to say in the panel is that I think the norm, I think that books do well or don't do well over a normal curve, whether they're traditionally published or whether they're self-published or however that you know there's always going to be a very few that do fantastically most of them are gonna sorry you know be in the middle and then there'll be some that just flop and I think that the same is probably true of promotion if you're a fantastic natural promoter and you're comfortable with it like Emma said great then that will probably only help but if you're not then you find what you are good at and if that's writing just another book you know, I, I would be very surprised if somebody did that large scale study if they found that. I think it's a real misconception. And I, I think it's fed by the fact that nobody knows what sells. William Goldman, you know, of Hollywood fame says nobody knows anything. And so when you see that somebody did Facebook really well and sold a whole bunch of books, then yeah, your publisher or your publicist, if they're not that savvy, Emma clearly not in mine neither, you know, will say, you've got to get on Facebook. Look, that's going to be the key. There is no key. You know, we don't know what's going to make a hit. It probably has something to do with a great book and word of mouth. Does it have to do with being able to tweet? No, I think some people will turn that to good, and some people won't. So I got very impassioned there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm also sometimes like worried about this question. I mean, I, I'm the person that will go home and say, oh, I should have said this and this, and I, I express myself best through writing. Um, so I, I think that for me what's been very helpful has been a blog um, because that's still writing and yet it is self-promotion in a way um, where, I mean, just in the sense that you get out there um, and, I mean, so, so the internet, the, the fact that it's <coughs> impersonal in some ways helps authors in, because, you know, you don't have to kind of like be intimidated of, you know, interviewing well or, or public speaking. Um, you can kind of just very, almost anonymously, but um, obviously that's not the point, um, kind of put yourself out there um, on the internet and, and, and blog and um, get publicized in that sense. Um, so it's a different skill than being good at, you know, just being very personal, which I agree is not always um, something that authors have. Um, but it's, there's that opportunity of connecting to people online that has only helped me. I, I'm curious, your question is that, I mean, your, your question is whether we should be suspicious of those who, those who are out there doing well or I just not suspicious quite. of them just how you see it impacting whether a book is able to get attention and oh, be yeah. 
uh, whether getting attention and being successful is the same thing or not uh, is, of course, up out to lunch or whatever the <laughs> saying is. But you know, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. more that than being suspicious of the author. I, the I would answer that with just an anecdote. I met with an author, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. And I was kind of on the fence about her first book, and we were talking about her next book. I wasn't the agent for her first book. Um, and, uh, and when she left, my assistant said, you know, there's something, there's something you should know about her. The first book did really well. Well, she's responsible for a lot of that. She can hustle. And, and he started naming all of the things she, she did in order to help her book sales. You know, I, you know, it, it, it's, uh, does it affect things? Yeah. Does it, does it, for, for me, does it check a box? Like, well, okay, that could be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, on the one hand. On the other hand, somebody's got hustle, you know, I mean, it's not a very attractive personality trait. You know, <laughs> but, you know, but it can be a good thing. The other thing is Facebook personalities or blogging personalities or you know any kind of personality that we see online doesn't necessarily reflect the personality of you know that that you see in person so in some ways the whole the whole um, the possibilities that are opened up by electronic media and social media it's kind of a nice thing for authors who don't who are misanthropic by nature <laughs> but can just sort of plug themselves you know via uh, Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is. So in some ways, I think it's it's very helpful for the you know uh, personality. Yeah. But if you're an author with a big social media presence, please don't feel the need to send every five star review that you get on Amazon to your entire following. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Hi, I I actually am not originally an author or a writer or anything like that. I had pursued a whole other career and find myself now with something to say, and that's why I'm writing a book. And uh, I went through the process of talking to an agent who, I was glad you asked that question because what she said to me was, this is a really viable book, but how the heck are you gonna market it? And I said, wait, I thought that's what the publishing company's supposed to do. And what I quickly learned through you know, understanding where things stand now is that even if a big house publishes your book, you're doing a lot of stuff on your own anyway. And, I, and then when I compared that head to head with self-publishing, it seems like I'm scratching my head wondering why anyone would do it through a publishing house. There seems, well, let me tell you all the things that came to me and I just want to know, rebut it, please. Tell me there's a reason that I shouldn't just self-publish it. That's really what I'm here to learn. You have more control over what, you get it out sooner, you make more royalties, you still have the possibility, I heard that agents troll self-published books to see the good ones so that they can then republish them and that um, you automatically have a distribution network if you do it through Amazon. So I, I, maybe that's really radical to say, but because I'm new to this, it just seems like, is that not obvious? Or is there some better reason why you should actually go through? And I, I, I admire your, you know, your fortitude to keep trying, to, and, but I don't, I don't understand, really, coming to this new, what, what the real benefit is. I mean, I guess if you're a bestseller, maybe there is, but if you're not, how do you, you know, so I think, it de as you said, I think it depends a lot on what kind of book you want, you wrote and or are writing. And you want to get to know what kind of book you're writing and what its potential is right away um, at, as much as you can at the outset. Because that will affect, do you want to spend, you know, yes, if you, even if things go absolutely swimmingly on the traditional publishing front and you're at the, you know, fast end of every time frame, it's still going to be probably at least, tell me if I'm wrong, Anna, but four years from finishing that book to seeing it on the shelf. Taking time to find an agent, go on submission, and then bring it out from, you know, my book was acquired and it was 22 months after it was acquired that it came out. Um, if you don't think that your book is going to be one that the house is really going to get behind and be excited about, um, and that has the potential to reach a wide audience, probably it is a, a more viable or I mean, I'm talking about it from the perspective of commercial fiction. Um, Anna will have a different perspective from literary fiction. But if you, think, if you think your book has commercial potential to speak to a wide audience, then committing that amount of time has immeasurable benefits. I mean, 
from co-op at Barnes and Noble to staff picks at an independent bookseller to maybe being an indie next pick to being a book of the month pick to selling in 40 foreign countries to um, I could go on and on. But if you don't think it has that potential or you're more a fan of the slow build, then I think that independent publishing is, is a very viable path that Liat probably has more to say about that. Oh, I, I think it depends on what your what your goals are. I mean, it, if it's to have the book printed and available, then self-publishing is fine. But if you if you want, you know, first of all, to be paid in advance for the work that you've done, um, you know, that's one thing. Uh, second thing, um, to be edited by by an editor, um, then to have a, a team in the house trying to figure out how to position your book and 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 you know, find an audience for it, um, that's another reason to be with the house. You're, you're, you know, we're talking about a publicity department, a marketing department, um, a, you know, sales force, all of these people trying to think about how to get your book into the right hands. Um, and that's another thing, if, if it's literary fiction, are they getting it to the right reviewers? You know, that's something that's their job. Um, if they're in marketing, are they thinking about where to buy advertisements? You know, is it the New Yorker? Is it People Magazine? Um, and there's and they're spending the money on those. They have access to that, and they're spending the money on it. Um, and then you know, book design. Somebody they're hiring somebody, or they have somebody in house who's designing the book, designing the inside of the book, consulting with you about that. They're sending it to their authors or to their colleagues' authors to ask for blurbs so that you know Juno Diaz will say something nice about your book. Um, then uh, you know when it comes out, they're paying for you to go on a little book tour or maybe a big book tour, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I mean, I would say you know a lot of authors complain about the fact that they have to do their they have to hustle themselves and they have to you know, or maybe hire a publicist or something like that. That has more to do with the fact that the, the industry's changed in a way the publishers can't keep up with necessarily. Sort of. But I wouldn't say, I would say publishing yourself um, means that you're limiting, or you're limiting yourself to the audience on Amazon that looks at self-published books, basically. And, you know, you're, you're missing out on all of those. You're, you're missing out on being sold in an independent bookstore unless it happens to be your local bookstore. I'm sorry. Oh, I just want to address one thing because it, the the I think the editing is hugely important because it's the you have to have a, the best product possible in order to have all this behind you. And at one of the panels that we had at the bookstore, Jenny, you said something about I, that the book that you were because you were ready to self-publish just not even the week. It was like days before you got the offer from Crown. And the book that you would have self-published was entirely different from the book that your editors helped you. Literally different, like a different book. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I just thought that was one of the most powerful statements about the quality, because everyone sees publishers as these gatekeepers who are just keeping all their money. Meanwhile, they're working really hard to create the best product out to, to get out there, the best. And if I can add to that what agents do, you know, we're, we're and publishers too, but we're trying to figure out if we can, and, tr and trying to sell the book in other countries, so it'll be published in translation. We're trying to sell the, the rights to, to Hollywood, not that it'll ever get made, but you'll get a little <laughs> bit of money out of it, you know, to right. get an option. We're, um, we're vetting your contracts so that, you know, Amazon's contract with its authors says, and you know, basically, we can change this contract at any time without telling you. Um, you know, we're, we're vetting contracts which are changing all the time to make sure that the, the interests of the author are protected. Um, I mean, that there's, yeah, there, there's a, there's, there are a lot of benefits, I would say. But if you have a direct audience, um, if you need a book as a calling card, if you're a consultant or you've got something that self-publishing is fabulous and gives you, then you, you, you are bringing a book as your calling card whenever you meet with a client or potential client and, and that works really well. I mean, I've seen that work tremendously well for people. Do you want to say anything? Um, I mean, I, I 
Agree. I mean, obviously, I, I saw those. Um, I compared also and just said, I mean, so many of the publishers that I wrote to said straight out, you know, and, and agents, like, um, that, I mean, publishers said, you know, they won't take anything unsolicited. unsolicited. Agents just, I mean, obviously, like, if this is a, a circular problem because they're getting so much... Um, so many queries that they can't be open to everyone but I mean it just felt like I wasn't doing anything at all to publicize my you know to try because I was getting nothing um, without even having shown anyone the book because I never got that chance so it just seemed like <coughs> I mean I think if um, for the next book I write I will try again and that um, one of my calculations in self-publishing was actually to see, hey, if I go to a publisher next time around and say, I've done well as a self-published author, um, and I've written a book, and you know I can do it, and I uh, have like the dedication to do it, um, then that will be mm -hmm. a sort of calling card. Um, so that was one of actually you know, the things that made my decision. Because, um, and, yeah, I, I think it's, um, there are advantages to both. I mean, I think, um, you know, having a lot of people that are very interested and have incentive to see your book succeed helps um, in terms of editing and publicity. Um, I was on my own. I mean, I found editors who I trusted and... Um, you know, I wasn't going to put out a book that I didn't think was, you know, good. <laughs> um, and that I didn't get feedback from other people about. But, um, but you definitely have a different kind of team working for you if you go with general publishing that I've seen. Uh, hi, um, I'm here uh, to answer the question because I work for a publisher. I'm an editor at a children's and young adult uh, publisher. And um, my question is mostly t for you, Margo, but for everybody who wants to answer. Um, right now, ebooks are being sold primarily by Amazon and also by people who self published, I guess, also Amazon. Um, but my, my question is whether or not independent booksellers will ever have a slice of the ebook market. And, I, and, I, and I'm not aware of, you know, I'm not aware of how it works, whether anybody the, besides large groups do it, but you know, I'm just curious. The American Booksellers Association went into a partnership with Google about, was it four years ago? And uh, we sold eBooks. You could download eBooks onto any device except for a Kindle since that's a proprietary product. But you know, uh, so it was, I think it was, a, it did not prove to be a large enough uh, revenue source for Google. So they backed out on it. Uh, the American Booksellers Association then uh, went into partnership with Kobo, which is a Canadian bookseller, and we now sell, I mean, you can opt as an independent bookseller to uh, sell the devices and have downloading, and we do that. Uh, and it definitely opened up the conversation with our customers, whereas before when people came in, and ask for ebooks. We're like, no, you know, <laughs> out, out. <laughs> but now we can have the conversation. It's, it's like a choice what people want. But we're finding that the, our customers who come to us want a book. They want to talk to a person. They want to have an entirely different interaction. If you're sitting at your computer and you want to download a book, yes. I think Amazon is the easiest thing. You breathe on the computer, your book is there. <laughs> it's, you know, and I think, I mean, I think Barnes & Noble found it equally hard to, to compete mm -hmm. with them. Uh, so uh, there are, yes, there are options, but it's, I, I feel like it's, we've got two different audiences. I think we need a public education movement that, you know, I went to Target the other day and I try to avoid those stores as much as possible, but the slogan was, um, expect more, pay less. 
and I thought it should be expect more, pay a little more because you're getting more. I mean, come on, you, you know, skip your latte at Starbucks, make it yourself or do what you have to do. And also I think that it's a calculation that we're not used to making. Like we'll spend the $10 in gas to drive out to the big box store. Whereas if we just frequented, you know, the local store, I mean, I literally went for something I couldn't get anywhere else and it was that or order it online. But you know, if you can make the extra effort, walk into your town to the local store to get your thing or drive to it and spend less money on, you know, if you really do the economics of it, supporting your local community probably comes out in your favor. Soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. I'm actually from Los Angeles, and I happen to have been here this week, and I found out online about the event. Um, and I'm here similarly. Uh, we chatted a little earlier. Um, I'm, I've been a, a writer of television and film and playwright out in Los Angeles. And I'm now in, engaged in writing a book about creativity. So I, I want to know what you, I mean actually, I'm also a, a singer. I did a, um, a CD last year of the music of Benny Carter, the great jazz saxophone player whose wife, Hilma Carter, was a Barnard graduate. And we met at the Barnard Club in Los Angeles. So um, I sung professionally for many years as well. And so it's really lovely to be back, Barnard. Um, anyway, I just, I wanted to um, address the, uh, the notion of nonfiction um, in terms of what your understanding of what, you know, whether it's the same sort of situation. I also want to say that this sounds painfully like the music business, having just gone through, uh, you know, CD release and all that last year. And it is, the business has just been decimated by this, the new platforms. It's just completely mm -hmm. taken away. Um, you know, and in the same way people are returning to vinyl, people are returning to books, and you know, but it's, it's you know, the, the impact of the technology has just been huge. I mean, it's like, you know, the typewriter, think about it, you know. <laughs> you know, things, things will change, they'll continue to change, but artists will consider to continue to express, and so, Mm, you know, if any of you have any Wait, thoughts about... Wait, so are about you, you're asking if, as, as what, a non-fiction book, what, is, is it what the would same be the sort better... Of thing? Yeah, and I mean, it, I I mean I've seen, I uh, right. you know, CD book, I know, was it Book Baby, which is yeah. like CD Baby, which just, you know, it's non-exclusive, you know, whether you sell them on numerous sites, whether, you know, electronically that becomes the same sort of thing that the music business to, is. To me, nonfiction, in, on one hand, is a lot easier because you've got, you've got a base, uh, people who are interested in your target audience. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can attract them first and then, I don't know, work out from there. That's, I mean, that's how, how, how we look at it. I don't know. I don't know if you've dealt with any nonfiction or yeah, I've represented a lot of nonfiction. I mean, it's it's uh, nonfiction. The sort of you know, um, the thing about nonfiction is that it, in a way it is much easier to sell. You know who your audience is. If it's about you know, if it's a sub it's subject based, unless it's unless it's memoir, which is a little bit m more like fiction. Right. Um, but uh, for the most part, nonfiction is is understood to be easier to easier to sell because it's easier to find the audience. Mm -hmm. The thing about uh, nonfiction, the difference between nonfiction and fiction when, when you're looking for a publisher, is that um, publishers usually buy nonfiction on proposal. So you're not writing the entire book, you're writing a book proposal, which is a strange animal and nobody would know how to write a book proposal unless they've gone, you know, they were told how to write a book proposal. Mm -hmm. I've, I've I've only ever seen two book proposals that were perfect. I mean, you know, sort of, uh, they really knew what they were doing. And they both went way outside of the box. Um, but, and then, you know, you, you write a sample of the book. But, and then you get an advance, it's sort of the old fashioned publishing novel. I mean, the publishing model, you, you get an advance so that you can write your book. You know, um, the idea is that you, you know, you're, you're being paid for your time. Yeah. Right. Unless you, decide to self-publish and do it, the, write it and throw it out there? Completely different model, yeah. Oh, I mean, so it's Well, it's option. not, you don't throw it out there. It's a lot easier with nonfiction. If you're writing a naval history, you know you 
right away target every uh, naval fraternity. I mean, I don't even know what's yeah. out there, but you, you know, you you <laughs> find you find them, yes. and you start there. Well, that's like the jazz record. You, yeah, exactly, you, know you start there, yes, and then you know, if it's good, the word gets out. Uh, I, I when I was first. Uh, Looking at Sea Biscuit, um, you know, it was pitched to me by the publisher. I'm like, okay, maybe we're near Aqueduct. Okay, maybe somebody, <laughs> one person might want a history of a horse. Like, you know, really, who cares? But the book yeah, right. was yeah. so fabulous yeah. that it transcended that uh, audience. So uh, it's, yeah. you know. No, thank you for saying that. I mean, one always, you know, as an artist, you're, you're really wanting to, to share your ashtray. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, another quick follow-up question, Jenny, for you. Um, I know you spoke about um, seeing the potential of your work, but besides your own group and your own resources for seeing that, what other um, tips would you have for seeing its potential in terms of marketing, or how right. can you be your, your own best judge if you're not so um, objective? You can't, and I mean, when I talk to writers, everybody thinks that their book will be a bestseller, and I can understand that, because any book can, Seabiscuit can, you know, so it's, you can't as, as be the own judge. And what I would do is try to get industry feedback. I mean, you know, Liat talked about writing from the gut and writing, what needs to be written and you know I loved hearing everything you had to say but I think we probably write very differently and um, when she began trying to get industry feedback and agents she saw that maybe that wasn't the best path it wasn't you know when I began querying I, I did hear from the very beginning that my work had commercial potential so I think you need to get out there and and see what what you know are you getting responses from readers that are more than just your writers group you know do, are they men women construction workers and and uh, college professors, you know, are you, you know, what are other objective eyes saying about your work? And be real brutal with yourself, you know. It can be a very hurtful, hard process. I tell this story where uh, my first novel was a completely unpublishable behemoth that was 180,000 words. I was wedded to every single one. I would have told you none of them could be cut, don't even change a comma. And when I began querying, um, Jonathan uh, Kellerman's agent sent me a very long, single-spaced, it was snail mail, uh, page of feedback. And one of the things he said was, I don't like spending so much time in your neurotic protagonist's head. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't write a neurotic protagonist. <laughs> and I went and I sat down and I looked at it and I saw what he was talking about and I cut 60,000 words in two weeks. So you have to let people, <laughs> Faith looks horrified, you have to let people be brutal with you and really be able to take that and evolve from there. And if you start hearing that your work has that potential, you'll know. And that might make you want to follow the traditional path a little more because you know, you'll know that that's the right one for you. I don't think it's the right one for everybody. And, and don't give your manuscript to anyone who loves you. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. They can't be trusted. <laughs> I just had another question. If you do that traditional route and the book is nearly finished, right? It's like it's sort of different than uh -huh. you know putting it up and saying I want an advance. How does that process work? Oh, I mean that's just you know, as it happens, it's finished. It's ready to go. So you chat. know, so you, which means sometimes publishers will have a slot. That's open, and you know they 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 plan their they they plan what they're going to publish way ahead of time. So maybe something fell through legal. The legal department said you know we can't publish this book for some reason. So they have a slot open, and there's a manuscript ready to you know it needs to be edited, but they're ready to go. Then they can slot it in in the next season or something like that. So it can be it can be a great thing to have the whole thing ready to go. Is that it? I think. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. You guys are a good audience. Yes, you were great. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.